There are no times or seasons that the Father is fixed by His own authority. And then he continues with Acts 1, 8, the great, uh, uh, in addition to the Great Commission, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. You will be my witnesses to Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria to the ends of the earth. And then verse 9, when he had said these things, and I just want you to get this in your mind for a second. They're not sitting in a movie theater. He's right in front of them. And when he had said these things, as they were looking on, he was lifted up and a cloud took him from their sight. What? What's going on? He's gone. Right? Now what do we do? He gave him a promise in Acts 1.8. Then Acts 1.9, he's gone. And their hope. The credits have rolled. What's going on with the character in the story? What's happening to all of these people? And then we fast forward again to Philippians chapter 3. And you see one of the guys acting in the story. I'm still busy. I'm still pressing forward. I'm still pursuing Christ. And here's what I want you to see. Having your life changed by Jesus is not the end of your story. Trusting Christ for the first time is not the end of this process. It's the beginning. This is where life begins. New life begins in Christ and only in Christ. You can try everything else in the world you want. And it will feel like you're starting over every time. And it will always be empty, but the one thing that never runs dry, the one place you can go, is the person and work of Jesus. And I hate to say this, but some people live as if their life is over when they trust Christ. I can't, I can't hang with them anymore. I can't, I can't go and be with my friends. I'm embarrassed of my new faith, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to withhold the truth from some of my friends. I'm not going to engage the way I might have, but I want to encourage you with something. You have nothing to lose in walking with Jesus day after day after day. Here's the hardest thing that you're going to hear from me tonight. Getting up every day and walking with Jesus is a choice you can make. That is a choice you make every day, whether you know it or not. And a choice to walk in a, in a pattern of an old way of life is a choice to disregard what Christ has done in your life. And having your life changed by Jesus is not the end of the story for you. It's the beginning. And I can imagine these disciples standing there looking up into the clouds and they're wondering, what are we going to do? I watched him die and then he came back to life and scared everybody half to death. I mean, how many guys are signing up for this kind of belief? Like the dude dies on a cross and he's, here he is, he's talking, right? He walks through walls, he appears in places. That would freak me out. I'm just going to be honest with you. Like, in my, my worldly view, not having read the whole Bible in that day, I probably would have run out the other door, right? This is, who is this guy, right? This is God's son. We know that now, but back then they're thinking... We saw him do all this stuff. Now what's happening? And I want to say something else. Our goal shouldn't be to just make it in Christian life. And I wonder how many of us have settled for a, I, I just got to make it. You ever said this? I just have to make it through this test. Ever had that? Like, or you, you wake up at three o'clock in the morning, worried about something that's beyond your control. I just have to make it through this day. I just have to make it through this next, this next event in my life. How many of you guys have a, a friendship or a relationship with your family that is, that is strained, and every time you sit down to have a meal with them, it's just like, uh, I just have to make it through this. Why do I have to sit down and have a meal with them? I can't take it, right? Some of us approach the Christian life as something we have to conquer instead of a relationship we have to enjoy. As the only relationship that we have in our lives, should have in our lives, as the place where we can find hope, we treat it as if it's a place where it's complete hostility. And when Paul writes Philippians chapter 3, he's trying to say, listen, my hope, my faith is in Christ, and I'm going to press on toward pursuing Him, regardless of what happens. Regardless of what happens, our goal should be to faithfully carry out the commands that Jesus gave us. What are they? Go and make disciples as you are going, as you're walking. Just a little hint, those of you coming this weekend, 
to be a part of Transform Weekend, you're going to get a heavy dose of as you are going. It's going to be awesome. I'm so excited about that. As we go, make disciples of Christ, baptizing them and teaching them. And behold, I'm with you always, is what he says, even to the end of the age. <clears throat> we have a, a Savior to serve. He's not a, a slave master. He's not a God who waits for you to mess up. He's a God who says, get busy. I've given you something to do. And pursuing Christ, we are never going to run out of new things to learn about God. Have you ever met someone who says, I've learned it all. I got nothing else. You can't teach me. I'm good. No? They may never say those words. Have you ever had somebody act like that? Oh, there go the faces. Casual eye rolls, yeah, hands up in the back. Right? Got you, bro. I'm right here. See it? I know some people like that. The cool thing about walking with Jesus is you will find out year after year after year just how much you didn't know that you thought you knew, and then he teaches you more stuff. But here's the key. Are you teachable? Are you teachable? Are you receiving what he has for you? We never run out of new things to learn about God. Here's some things that we can learn. New ways to love our neighbors as Christ did and have more opportunities to share the best news, the best story in the world. And here's my fear. You ready for my fear? My greatest fear of what I do week after week, year after year. I look at church kids who have no idea how good that story is. Yeah, I said it. What is the best story in all the world? Here it is. Very, very simple. The God who made you sent his son to die to save you so that you can spend eternity with him by simply pl placing your faith and your trust in Christ's finished work on the cross for you. New life. New life begins in that moment. And I think we have been overchurched and overstudied so long that we've forgotten the power of that story. I grew up in rooms just like this, but it wasn't until God came in and he made that story real in my life that I began to say, wow, this truly is the best story in the world. New ways to love our neighbors as Christ did and have more opportunities to share the best news in the world. I want to share something with you. Look at Philippians chapter 3 one more time. Verse 13 and 14. If you had in your life ever, ever had this, this one thing that you wanted to pursue, just one, one thing, one, just give me, give me one thing, any, anybody, one thing you wanted to do, you wanted to be, you would give, yeah, Griffin. Professional soccer player. Professional soccer player. Anybody else? I can't, well, what? What happened? Say, share it with everybody. Okay, she said it too. <laughs> Famous on YouTube. Famous on, oh yeah. Famous on. No? Okay. Famous, okay, enough. See, this is, this is the issue right here. here. Here we go, here we go. We care more about our own fame than the one that Jesus gave us to share. Ouch. Pursuing professional soccer is a career goal. That's nothing wrong with that. Being YouTube famous, that's cool. Let me ask you a question. What are you busy sharing? What are you busy sharing? Your humor? Great. People die every day never hearing the name Jesus. And we have the greatest platform ever called the internet, social media. The opportunities are endless for me to take the passion and the joy that I have knowing that God has done what only he can do. And instead, we'd rather... Waste it. I'm guilty, guys. I'm guilty as well. I'm not mad. I'm just being honest. Here's what Paul says. Verse 13, Philippians chapter 3. One thing I do. One thing I do. Forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead. Just, just stop for a second. 
If the goal of the Christian life is not to sit and be lazy, but to be busy about sharing, what is Paul saying? I'm not worried about what happened. I'm not worried about what I can't change. I'm worried about what I can do tomorrow. And in the next five minutes, to make much of Jesus, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Nothing else matters. One thing. One thing. What's your one thing? What's your one thing? Because what I'm getting at here in just a second, see, even the greatest things in our past pale in comparison to walking with Him. Even the greatest experiences you've ever had, the greatest joy you've ever felt, they pale in comparison. They're not even close to walking with Jesus. But here's the deal. Those who make light of that statement have never walked with him. Because I can promise you, I've tried it. Nothing satisfies. Nothing is as hope-filled. Nothing is as joyful. Nothing is as fun as knowing the king and being known by him. So I have a question, where to now? We've just finished, if you don't know, we've just finished eight weeks in this series about growing closer in discipleship, walking with Jesus. What does that look like? What are we going to do? Now, you have pieces of paper in your seat, um, and there are pens in the back. If I can grab, have some help with the pens. If you need a pen, hold your hand up. If you already have one, great. Here's what I want you to do. Everybody, look this way. Look this way. The pins will come to you. Just keep your hand up. <clears throat> and I think we have uh, more of that paper right there, right by the camera, behind the camera on the, on the tab. Um, I want to ask everyone to do something, too. We may have enough. Is that a lot? It's not a lot. I want to put something on the screen here. I want to ask everybody to focus. Look at me. Wait, look at me. Look up here. Pens are passed out. I need you to hear what I'm about to say. Where to now? This is the beginning of the discipleship process for each of us in the room. I don't care if you sat through all of these or if you just come to one of this series, our goal is to see as many people in, in a discipling relationship with a loving adult, someone that has, has volunteered to come alongside you and walk with you and help you grow. That's the whole point of everything we've done. Understanding the word, knowing how to study the word, knowing what it means to take the gospel to our friends, to bring them into those relationships. That's what's next. But here's what I have for you. If this is the beginning of a discipling process for you, you've never been in that relation, had a relationship with someone who's gonna disciple you, or you want one. You say, man, I've had one before, it was awesome. Or I've had one, it didn't really go well, but I want another shot. I want you to do me a favor right now. And I want you to talk to your neighbor. I don't want you to, it doesn't have to be shared with anyone. I'm gonna ask you to do something. If you are interested in being discipled by a leader from this student ministry in this church, we have people ready to do that. I want you to write your name down and I want you to write your number down on a piece of paper. That's all I want you to do. And I want you to fold it in half. And I want you to hold on to it because we're, we're not completely done with this yet. If you're interested in that process, I want you to write your name and your phone number, your contact information on there. And we are going to contact you and begin placing you and partnering you with people who, who wish to disciple students. Next thing that I wanted to share with you. The gospel is received through evangelism and lived out through discipleship. The gospel is received through evangelism, someone sharing the good news, and it's lived out through discipleship. What does that mean? Here's what that means. Remember the very first message we did in this series when I had volunteers come up and I showed you how Jesus discipled his disciples, right? He had 12, then he had how many? Three. Intentional, one-on-one, -on -one accountability, growing in Christ. This is what this looks like. Discipleship is not sitting around talking about how, how awful your week was and how bad your teachers are. Discipleship is studying the word, growing in the word, and being held accountable when you miss it. That's discipleship. 
To say discipleship is happening without ever opening a Bible is very shallow. It's very shallow. Because the point of discipleship is to become more like Christ, to grow as a disciple. And the only way we do that is to come face to face with who he is by what the word says. So that's what we're going to do in these relationships. I wanted you to see this because it's extremely important that we understand discipleship happens in these groups that we're working to form. But here's the other thing. If the gospel is received through evangelism and lived out through discipleship, who gets discipled? <laughs> believers and new believers. As we live out the gospel in discipleship, guess what happens? Other people go, man, what's, what's different about you? Well, tell me about this group you, you can't wait to get to and you will not miss for anything. Tell me about that. And then all of a sudden you get to reproduce what's happening in your life. Because the purpose of discipleship is growth and multiplication. Not growth in numbers. Don't hear me say this. Growth in you. Growth in maturity. Because what did he say? Verse 15 of Philippians chapter 3. Let those of us who are mature think this way. And if in anything you think otherwise, God will reveal that also to you. Only let us hold, to, hold true to what we have attained. The purpose of discipleship is growth and multiplication. My next question for you. Here's the next question. If you are interested in being in one of those discipling groups, which I hope you are, because that's where life happens, guys. I'm telling you, it's awesome. Who are you going to invite to join you? Who will you say, man, after a period of being discipled, I want to bring someone in with me and start my own? Think of that name. And you don't have to write it down. I want you to write it. Actually, you write it down somewhere. Not on that piece of paper you're giving to us. I want you to have that name in your mind. Have that name in your mind. See, if the purpose of discipleship is growth and multiplication, not lazy Christianity. Let me tell you what the world does not need more of. That. I would love to see a generation of students armed with the tools to disciple their peers in a relationship with Christ. What does that look like? Man, that is active, passionate, growing, attractive Christianity. Lazy Christianity says, well, they're not like me. I tried. It's hard. Passionate, active, growing, people who desire to be formed in the image of Christ, man, they take this and they run with it. So here's my challenge to you. Do you desire to be in a relationship with someone who's going to disciple you for a season? And then will you in turn disciple someone else? And you're probably thinking, how in the world am I going to do that? We're going to show you. We're going to show you. So who will you pursue to grow in Christ with? Who will you intentionally go after to grow in your relationship with Christ? I don't have a lot of discussion questions tonight. I have that one. And what I'd like for us to do as we get ready to dismiss, I just, I just have a question. This is not a discussion question. This is, um, this is a a relevant question to the room. In this series, we've talked a whole lot about, about growing in our relationship with Christ. And that one statement presupposes that every person in this room has trusted Christ. Has at least begun the process of growing in Christ. You've at least started a relationship with Jesus. And I'm not talking something crazy spiritual. I'm talking a, a choice to put your faith and your trust in Christ. You're done working on it on your own. You're done trying to be enough. And you're, you're actively pursuing a relationship with Christ. If you have never placed your faith and trust in Christ, I, I want to know that so we can pray for you. And maybe today could be your day. Tonight could be the night. You settle that once and for all. I'm not talking about a prayer, guys. One thing that makes me more nervous than anything is when a guy leads somebody in a sinner's prayer. Not because the prayer is bad. 
But far too many times, the hope is placed in the prayer and not the heart of the person that God is working on. Well, I said the sinner's prayer, awesome. Have you trusted Jesus? Well, I've been in church my whole life, that's great. Have you trusted Jesus? That's all I'm asking. Do you know him as your savior or is he a big scary guy in the sky, somebody you don't really believe in? Is he your savior? Do you know him? Do you know him? If you don't, you can meet him tonight. I've heard somebody say this before and uh, I agree with it. And who said it is not a pastor. The God who made you and died to save you. Man, he loves you and he misses you. So you trust him? Promise it's not a mistake. It's the best choice you'll ever make. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for this night. And God, I hope that I hope that someone in this room who is far from you would make that, that first step in repentance and faith and come home. I don't know who or what the condition of everyone's soul is in this room, but I can't move past the reality that we have talked a lot about growing in a relationship with you and there very well may be someone here who does not have a relationship with you. They have no idea what I'm talking about. But God, you know them. You made them and you sent your son to die on a cross to save them. So God, I pray that you would make yourself very real to them. I pray that we would be a people who, who forget what lies behind us. The pain that is back there, the hurt that is back there, the, the frustration. And we would press on toward the goal of the upward call of God and Christ. That we would passionately pursue relationship with you. Would you move us to be a people who grow as disciples of Christ and no one else? God, would you save someone tonight? For the first time, set them free and help them begin a relationship with you. I pray these things in Jesus' good name. Amen. I do have.